this six-year-old Rhodesian Ridgeback with a mass in the proximal femur on the right-hand side, just to get you oriented. This is dorsal, that's the stifle down there, that's the caudal aspect, and that's cranial up here. Um, biopsy performed previously was consistent with either a chondroblastic osteosarcoma or a osteosarcoma, uh, sorry, a chondrosarcoma. And so we did a CT scan and it does appear that the soft tissue component of the mass appears to be attached to the pelvis. And so we are going to do a hemipelvectomy instead of an amputation. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so you'll get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. Now the location of the biopsy incision is going to make it challenging to excise the biopsy incision and close the wound. So what we're going to do is I'm going to harvest a flank fold flap before we amputate the leg because we, we can take as much flank fold flap as we want. Um, so I'm going to harvest a bunch of skin from my flank fold flap and then come down around the side here up around over here. And so that flank fold flap is just going to serve as our skin flap for closure. And I have found that to be very effective in, um, in managing the skin def defect that forms when you have to remove a biopsy trap. So go ahead and start my incision here. Can we get some extra towel clamps, please? And just confirming our cautery is plugged in. And uh, can we get coag and cut on 40, please? Thank you. I have to stay fairly superficial here because the tumor is not that far below beneath the skin in this area. So I'm just cutting through a vessel that's commonly used for an axial pattern flap in this area. Anybody know what that is? It's a suction plug. It's a suction plug. So I'm about to cut through a vessel that comes up right through here that's used for an axial pattern flap, and just wondering if anybody would know what that is. I know, it's hard. So just to, for those of you that are joining us late, we've got it either a chondrosarcoma or the chondroblastic osteosarcoma and the proximal femur um, in this Rhodesian Ridgeback. And so we're having to excise that biopsy tract. And so I'm harvesting a flank fold flap before I do the hemipelvectomy. And that's going to be used to close our defect. And so the name of that vessel, see if anybody has gotten it. So the name um, of that vessel is the geniculate artery. And that's a great axial pattern flap, very consistent and reliable. Good for defects that are in the distal limb, distal to the stifle. So hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing there. Just coming around the groin here. Now, I'm going to um, split the pelvis at the pubic symphysis. I have found that to be the easiest and uh, reduces the need for cutting muscle and bone and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the way that I like to do them. You have to split out the adductor muscle. We've also got this triginous fat here that we'll have to go through. Um, and um, hemipelvectomies, 
they're technically a bit challenging. You just have to know a bit more anatomy than you do with, an, or a different anatomy than you do with an amputation. But clinically, they do just as well as an amputation, if not better. Um, the only other thing that we have to watch out for is that we're going to create an inguinal hernia um, with the surgery, and so we have to make sure that we address that. And what I usually end up doing is doing a polypropylene mesh to reestablish that pelvic diaphragm. So I'm just going to dissect down through here and get to our pubic symphysis, and I have to split the adductor muscles one side from the other. Kind of the same approach that you would do doing a triple pelvic osteotomy or in doing a um, juvenile pubic symphysiodesis. So I'm down to the pubis right here. Um, so I'm just going to bring my skin down. I'm just trying to get an increased exposure before I start cutting stuff because if I get a vessel, inadvertently cut a big vessel, I want to make sure that I've got exposure to um, identify that bleeder and to address it. And these are quite fun surgeries because you really have to know and review your anatomy before you get in there and it's something that we don't do every day and so you want to make sure that you um, review your anatomy before you try anything like this. So I've got this huge flank fold flap here. My goal with these is always to do a bloodless surgery. So my goal is to use only one lap sponge for the whole surgery. I don't always succeed. But it's just a matter of, of just being slow and deliberate and trying to ligate our vessels before we transect them. And you can see in here just a very robust blood supply to our flank fold flap and it's no wonder they survive. Uh, yeah, so there's the robust blood supply to the flank fold flap. And fat, which is what we're cauterizing through now, does not conduct electricity very well. So very fatty tissue. It can be hard to cut with cautery. Now, uh, another quiz question. Do we need to cut any of the heads of the quadriceps muscle for this procedure? We have Sean shaking his head here. Final answer? Anybody else have any ideas on whether we have to cut any of the heads of the quadriceps muscle to do this surgery? Yeah, so Sean's right. We don't have to we don't have to cut any of the heads of the quadriceps muscle. I'm gonna come around that side. Alex. I've got the superstar intern and resident with us. So that's pectineus muscle right there. Feel that. So that's a really tight little band right there. And that used to be a surgery that people did for hip dysplasia was was a pectinotomy. And the idea was that the pectineus, the way it contracts, it's, it's basically trying to luxate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's the femoral artery, femoral vein. So we've got a bunch of big scaries right in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sartorius is right there that Sean just pointed out. So I'm cutting through the, insert, or the origin of the pectineus muscle on the pubis. You have to be really careful because just deep to that, is the, and just be careful moving the light, yep, 
um, because they're huge blood vessels. So that's a vessel that's about the size of a pencil. And that's one that's about the size of a Sharpie right in front there. So we just have to be really careful. And I tend not to ligate the vessels first. Um, I tend to do that later. All right, so I'm down two pubis right here. And the two adductor muscles are joining in the middle. We've got a special guest joining us today. Ben Milky, one of our other surgeons. <laughs> and it's always a little bit frustrating that we don't get to scrub very much together because we have our own caseload, so it's always a treat to get to scrub with another, another specialist. So that's the um, junction between the two adductor muscles there, and that's the pubic symphysis right there. All right, so, and uh, Ben, what I've done first is I've harvested a big flank fold flap so that we'll, uh, we'll use that to cover a defect. So now I'm just going through the junction between the two sides of the adductor muscle, right down to the pubis here. And staying on that junction between the two sides, we're trying to avoid um, getting a lot of blood vessels. So that's a fairly avascular region of those two muscles. Coming around the back here. Is the part of the gracilis incorporated in this um, bundle? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, just get my gelpies in here. So I'm down to pubis right here. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to get a home and retractor around the back of the pubis, and I'm doing basically the same thing that I would do during a juvenile pubic symphysiodesis. So I've got a homen around the back of the um, pubis. Uh, like a middle, a medium. Can I get a blade about that long? And we have to remember that our urethra is going to be just deep to where we are. So now I'm going to create an abdominal hernia right here. So that is, my finger is in the abdomen here. Okay, so if we stick a finger underneath here, we can protect the urethra from my saw blade. Now it would be a big ask to ask Sean to stick his finger in there. And so I will use my own finger. It also helps me to direct the blade. So I've got my finger in there now. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I'm just going to start cutting that before. I'm just going partial thickness. All right, so now I've got a, because I've gone partial thickness, I've got a guide now for my blade. Okay, so I can feel that on my finger. A little bit tickly on my finger as the blade hits it.
So that's all the way through. And then I'll get some instrument. See if I can split that apart to make sure that that's completely released. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but that's completely separate. Okay. So now I'll just pack this off. Now I've got the prepubic tendon right up here against the pubis. And I'm going to be re uh, really careful as I come around because I'm going to encounter some really big freaking blood vessels. Everybody knows my saying, which is don't cut anything you know the name of. And don't cut any vessels or any uh, structure with less than eight letters in the name. Thank you. So that's femoral vein right there. So I'm just trying to dissect out these vessels and there's a lot of branching and stuff right in this region. Um, which can make it tricky and I have seen people inadvertently uh, ligate the vessel and then cut proximal to it inadvertently. So that's my femoral artery almost to the point of the iliac artery right there. Uh, yep, yeah, thanks. So I'm around that huge femoral artery right there, which is about the size of a Sharpie. Sorry, Ben. No, no. Yeah. And I'll get some, maybe some 2 PDS to transfix it. Keep holding on to that. And it's kind of controversial whether you ligate the artery or the vein first with cancer surgery. The idea being that if you ligate the vein first, you're going to prevent spread of the tumor as you devitalize it. Um, the benefit of ligating the artery first is that you can reduce the hemorrhage by, uh, by interrupting the blood supply as early as you can in the process. So I'm doing a little transfictional ligature here. So I'll do a couple of throws on one side and then I'm going to pass it through underneath and then I'll tie another three throws on top. I'm sure that this is too small for you guys to be able to see on the live stream. I'm cutting slightly closer to my distal ligature. And lift up that ligature, please. Now, there are a few branches in here that we're going to try to address. I think this one is small enough to ligature through. So this is about three millimeters in diameter. I'm going to big fat vessel right there. Can we get the table up just a little bit, please? Thank you. Yep. Yep, keep going. 
That's great, thank you. Hold on to that, please. So, Sean, do you know how many throws you need on silk to have a secure knot? Four to six. Interestingly, it's just two. That's the only suture that is secure with two throws. I still do five or six, mind you. Sleep better at night. Yeah, hold on to that, please. So another transfictional. Now, the purpose of the transfictional ligature is just to make sure that my primary ligature doesn't slip off. Must be new mats and bombs. They're very sharp or recently sharpened. All right, so now I've got the femoral vein in here, which is about the size of a sharpie. And I don't need to transfix the vein. Beautiful, thank you. Greasy. You know what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to um, ligature it as well. Thank you. So that should be the majority of the blood supply in here, although you have to be careful because sometimes you'll have some weird aberrant little branches that you'll encounter. And I use the word encounter in quotes. <laughs> so that's iliopsoas muscle right there. And, and what travels through the iliopsoas muscle? Sean? Know, We've sorry. done an epidural. Yeah. Yep. Um, femoral nerve. Right. Yes. Right under. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so that's the femoral nerve getting excited right there. And that's the femoral nerve right in the middle of the ellipsoas. So I'll just transect that. Now there's a lot of work done in humans about avoiding neuromas by reimplanting the nerve in a muscle belly. Still stimulating that femoral nerve, the distal branches. All right, so a little bit of bleeding in here, not much. So that's going to be a branch of the iliolumbar vessel. And that's the big vessel that you can hit inadvertently when you're cutting the ilial wing. That looks pretty good, though. So now I've got some... Sorry. It's not crackle pop. All right, so I've got a little bit of bleeding up here. So that's femoral nerve right there. That's the medial aspect of the ilial wing. So stick your finger in there. So we've just come around the medial aspect of the ilial wing. And that's where the ilial lumbar vessel is going to be. All right, 
so that you can see the iliolumbar vessel right in here. We can see it, you can't. And that comes around over the top of the acetabulum. Um, I would love to ligate that. We'll just get another pack of silk, I reckon. So this ilia lumbar vessel um, is the one that you can inadvertently cut when you're cutting that ilia wing. So if we can ligate that beforehand. So that's what I mean about taking your time and trying to ligate vessels before um, you cut them. So this is the iliolumbar vein that I'm ligating. And you can see the abdominal fat creeping up into our incision here. I'll just hold on to that. Thank you. Yeah. Now I have to tuck this as far in as I can because I have to make room for my scissors. Let's just try to get that abdominal fat out of the way. I cannot make much room here. Pull on that a little bit more forcefully. Sorry, I can't see. You alright? Right. Still not a lot of distance there. I'll ligature that. Ligature is allegedly good for up to seven millimeters in diameter vessels, but I wouldn't trust it for that, certainly not on its own. And I have had bleeding break through vessels before, even smaller ones. significant. But I would like to address that because I don't want to get into my second lap sponge. Okay, so I'm right into my pelvic canal. I'm probably getting to my sciatic nerve right there. So I can see that. Can you guys see that sciatic nerve? Mm -hmm. I doubt you can see it on the live stream, especially with Alex's head in the way. All right, so we're just slowly and carefully making our way around. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to dissect. So our iliac wing is right here. So I'm going to dissect through my sartor sartorius muscle and get down onto our ilial wing. So through the sartorius and then through the gluteal muscles. So that's sartorius. That's Mr. Sartorius and then Mrs. Sartorius is just behind. I guess that's sexist saying that the Mr. is in front. But that's how I remembered it in vet school. All right, so this may be what? It's one of two muscles. 
could be rectus femoris or it could be um, tensor fascia lata. And it's a little bit broader based, and so it might be the tensor fascia lata. Got a few other vessels in here that I need to ligate. Thanks, Ben. So just ligating through or cutting through some muscle bellies here. Okay, so I'm down to the ventral aspect of the ilial wing, right there. Those tendons really pop. All right, so now we're down to ilial wing here. I'm getting to some gluteal muscles. I'm just going to get my skin, incise through my skin some more up here. All right, I don't need to, but I'm going to use a new sponge. <laughs> Got plenty of room in this one. Sure. <laughs> just that I'm using it to provide some pressure. So now I'm just cutting around my biopsy incision. Just being careful not to go too deep so I don't cut into tumor because the tumor is again relatively superficial. blood that's coming from the distal segment is quite purple, suggesting that the blood supply has been cut off by our ligating the femoral artery. So I'm just coming around now. So this is probably a gluteal muscle here. greater trochanter there, so that would make sense. And that is attached to the face of the ileal wing. There's a saying, some people name them and cut them, and some people just cut them. <laughs> I try to name them and cut them in areas that I spend a lot of time in surgery. It's a lot easier. Yeah. 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 Let's just let that down here. So the exact location of the tumor is the proximal femur, femoral neck, and getting up into the um, uh, acetabulum. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pack one sponge in here and then I'm going to get a homan and come around the top 
of the ilia wing there. Can I get a periosteal elevator, please? Thank you. Uh, so now I'm looking at ilia wing. And you'll see that when I cut that, all of a sudden the leg's going to release. I'm just making sure. So there's sciatic nerve there. You can see it twitching as I, right there. And we'll get another gelpie in here. Yeah. We'll have a Okay, so that's a really nice view of the ilia wing. Hopefully you guys can see it. And I want to go as far cranial as I can. So I'm actually palpating sacrum right there. Did it touch? Sorry. We'll go ahead and split that ilia wing. And that's the sciatic nerve right there. Go ahead, you can let that fall. All right, so the sciatic nerve is sitting right there. And lo and behold, we're looking at colon here, and urinary bladder and urethra and all that good stuff. A little bit of bleeding here, I think just from the... Yeah, now we've transected our sciatic nerve already which is fine, but you see how easy it would be to do that during a double pel pelvic osteotomy? Mm. Run bone wax or are you fine? Uh, I think we're okay. Just making sure that there are no vessels. So there's more of the iliolumbar vessel. Uh, yeah. Just, just cut through the ilia wing. Okay. Open. Close. And we're literally nearly done with the surgery. So we've done all the hard bits. There are a few big vessels up caudally and dorsally that we need to address. And I might ligature through that. Just to give us an extra little layer of security. Okay. So now these are going to be a bit of um, a bit of gluteal muscle. All right. And what do we have 
here. We've got some little muscles that are in the medial aspect of the pelvis. Uh, Obturator will be uh, cranially a little bit and on the other surface. And then we have sacred tuberous ligament. And the trickiest one is that iliolumbar vessel. That's the one that sneaks up on you when you least expect it. Crackle pop. All right, so things looking really good here. Bring this back up. Just put my single lap sponge. Here's my other one. Certainly not going to go on to three. <laughs> You can't get lazy and impatient at this point. So I've nearly got it off. I'm going to hurry up now. You have to make sure that you take your time and I get all those vessels. There's a tendency to get to this point and just be like, I just need to get this leg off. I'm getting bored. And you have to make sure you slow down. There's a guy who heard that 90% of car accidents happen within five kilometers of home, so he moved. <laughs> All right, so those are big vessels associated with the urethra. side. So we are we are literally nearly home free. So I said it might be easier than an amputation. It may not be easier, but it certainly is more fun. So that's down to um, issue cavernosis there. Just be careful that I'm not cutting any part of the urethra because it is very, very close to here.
you put a new path of recovery? Uh, you can do, yep. Sean's just asking if we should put in a new path on recovery. So basically, this is all that's left here. This little skin bridge in front of the vulva. Yep, so the vagina looks like it's intact. We should be able to just lift that leg off. So that's the leg off there. And one and a half lap sponges. <laughs> uh, we'll call it one. <laughs> you did slightly more than just an amputation, Charles. Yeah. So. All right, so now we've got a hernia here. So we've got this abdominal the prepubic tendon right here. And basically, so that's going straight into the abdomen. So we have to figure out what we're going to do to close that. Whether And I haven't decided whether I'm going to do a polypropylene mesh. So that's colon right there. Feel that? You can feel stool in the colon. So we, have, we have heaps of skin here because of that procedure that we did before. Um, so if I were to do a polypropylene mesh, what would I suture it to is the other question. And again, I have had a bladder herniate. Um, it was a vet's dog, of course it is, was. Um, a vet named Bob, I'll give you his last name. And his dog had a hemipelvectomy with me, and it herniated its bladder, and so we had to go back in. All right, so that's all abdominal um, fat here. Can I please get some polypropylene mesh? if I can zoom in a little bit for the closure. Yeah, we can take that out. Got a little enlarged lymph node here. Could be just reactive, but we'll send that off. So can I pull that prepubic tendon all the way up to there is the question. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so pair of scissors here. I'm just gonna start shaping it a little bit. Can I get some OPDS, please? Okay. Thank you. Do we have a bigger set? So I'm sure I've told you this story before, but for those of you that haven't heard it, polypropylene mesh, when I came to Australia, cost $950 a sheet wow. like that. And I found the company that provides the polypropylene mesh to the distributor, which is a big human company to remain nameless. And they would sell me a roll of it. Um, but they would only sell to distributors. So I had to become a quote unquote distributor to buy 
a roll of polypropylene mesh. And so now we process it ourselves and we pay $4 a sheet. A little cost savings. So I have about 2,000 sheets of polypropylene mesh from this one roll. No, maybe <laughs> that I bought once about 15 years ago. No. Nah. I, I mean, there are different types, mm -hmm. but polypropylene mesh is still polypropylene mesh. And I'm trying to keep the edge of the mesh outside of the abdomen. It's not critical to do that, but I just the edge is, is kind of rough, so I'm trying to avoid that being in contact with the internal organs. So we just process it by soaking it in 90% ethanol um, for about a half an hour, and then just doing normal ethylene oxide sterilization. I'm just suturing through prepubic tendon and into the polypropylene. Once I get to the end of the prepubic tendon, I'm going to start suturing it to the adductor muscle on the opposite side. I uh, just to recreate an abdominal wall because otherwise the bladder will poke through. No, so, so everything is just going to stay where it is now. the adductor now. Be careful not to suture into the urethra. That would be embarrassing. And rather uncomfortable, I would imagine. What do you do to avoid it? I just know where it is. to up here. So that's colon right there. I can't really suit you to that. Got some muscle here. I might trim a bit more of that off back here. I'm just going to come back to connective tissue here.
Sean. You're just going to suture to the external fascia of the gluteal muscle all the way back down to there. And then if we can get a little bit of fat to cover that, and then just pull this across and do an intradermal. Yep. Happy with all that? Yep. All right, so it's going to come over to the streaming console to see if there are any questions that I haven't answered. So just on 56 minutes. Um, you can use the same polypropylene mesh um, for diaphragmatic hernias. Hi Massachusetts, hi California, hi California, hi Germany. Um, I did an epidural on this dog um, and that should be plenty high enough. Hi Romania, hi Houston. Uh, and there's a question about why do I ligate later. So the reason why I tend to try to wait on these is so that I don't have a false sense of security in thinking that I've ligated all the vessels peripherally because what happens sometimes is that you think you've ligated them peripherally and then you end up cutting something that you haven't ligated already. So, um, hi South Africa, hi Colombia, Argentina. California, California, Oklahoma. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, so basically, we're just going to do a sub-Q closure, and then we're going to take that big uh, flank fold flap that we created at the beginning of the surgery and bring that across to close the defect. Sean, can you just pull that across to show how that's going to uh, be plenty of skin? So we've got heaps of skin there to close that up, and I'm not going to put any kind of drain in here because that mesh communicates with the abdomen. The abdomen is, a gr is great at resorbing fluid, so um, yeah, so that's, we've got plenty of, plenty of room there. Um, so if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel, make sure you turn on notifications, um, and uh, uh, turn on notifications so you'll get a ding in your phone the next time we live stream. And thanks for all the kind messages. Um, Kevin says, thank you for your videos, they get me excited about being a vet, um, so that's really nice. Anyway, um, I don't think I'm live streaming anything again today, but maybe tomorrow. Uh, so I will talk to you guys again soon.